Good morning. This is Pastor Kerry Rogers here to give you your morning manna. And I pray that you're blessed today. I know you're up and at them. So this morning, let's learn about two pillars of one body. That is two pillars of one body. Go ahead, get your word, get your papers, take some notes, and I know you're going to be tremendously blessed. But before we begin, let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for the word of God. We thank you, Lord, for the true pillars of one body, today's subject. We pray that you give us clarity and understanding of your word, and may we apply your word in our lives today. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Okay, my friend, two pillars of one body. In order to know the truth from the false, you must study and know the truth to recognize the false. It's just like in counterfeit bills. You don't study the counterfeit in order to know the truth. You study the true bill or dollar or $100 bill or what have you. And if you study that, you know what a fake $100 bill is like. Well, the same when it's true when it's God's word. You don't study all the false foolishness. You study God's truth. The majority of churches who have, quote unquote, church in their name, or they may profess to be part of God's church, do not really understand the true biblical meaning of church. There are literally hundreds of churches, but how does a person know which church to be active in? Should they choose a church based on a denominational name, uh, close proximity, Good choir or entertainment, preacher preach good, preacher preach short. Let's see what the Bible says. Now, if you go to eSword Bible application or the Bible app, uh, you search the word church, you'll find that the word church is used in the Bible about 80 times. See, church is a biblical concept that the true people of God must understand. Most people don't understand the true biblical meaning and understanding of church because they don't study the origins and the purpose of God's one true church. They may make assumptions instead of studying the true meaning that directly comes from the Bible. So today we're going to build a foundational understanding of church. Now, what is the meaning of church? Greek word for church in the New Testament means you go to the Strong's Greek Dictionary, it means calling out or assembly. If you go to Thayer's definition, it means a gathering of citizens called out from their homes into some public place and assembly. Now, a church denominational group may call themselves a church, but how do you know if they are part of God's true church? The Bible clearly reveals the true church of Christ and its standards, and how to be a member of a true church. Now, how many churches does God have in the Bible? Well, let's go ahead and find out what the Bible says. Ephesians 4, 4 through 6. Ephesians 4, 4 through 6. And this is what the Bible says. There is one body, one spirit, even as ye are called in one hope of your calling. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. So God makes it clear that he only has how many churches, my friend? One, just like a person has one body. That's why he calls it one body, compares the church to a body. So he says he has one body, one spirit, one hope, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. So God's one body is referring to the spiritual church of God. The one body is the one church of Jesus Christ. And who is the head of that body? Amen. I know you got it. Jesus is the head. Matter of fact, Ephesians 5.23 says, For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church. And he is the savior of the body. So Jesus Christ is the head of his church, his one true church, and he's a savior of the entire body. Let's go to 
Colossians 1.18. It's Colossians 1.18, and it says he, referring to Jesus, is a head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have preeminence. There is only one head, and that is Jesus Christ. Jesus is the only one that is qualified to be the head and neck of the church that moves the body. The pastor's not the head. The deacon's not the head. The elder's not the head. The uh, conference president's not the head. Jesus Christ is the head of his church. Amen. Let's go to Romans 12, 4 and 5. Romans 12, 4 and 5. For as we have many members in one body, and all members have not the same office. So we, being many, are one body in Christ, and every member's one of another. So if you look at the Greek word members, is melos, and it means a limb or part of the body, a quote-unquote member. And so if we are part of God's body, we are a limb that is part of God's body. Now, those who are a limb of the body are submissive to the brain that controls and leads all of its members, just like, a, just like in a real body. See, the limbs are obedient to the brain, the head. We know Jesus Christ. Plus, there are no inactive members or inactive limbs in the body of Christ. I'm talking about the true body of Christ. All have importance, but they are all active in doing the work of God being controlled by the head. Jesus does not have dead limbs or gangrene in the limbs or organs of his body. Everybody's working. See, gangrene is a type of disease that caused, that is caused by a critically insignificant blood supply. This potentially life-threatening condition may occur after an injury or an infection or in people suffering from a chronic health problem affecting blood circulation. The primary cause of gangrene is reduced blood supply to the affected tissues, which result in cell death. And that, if that particular limb is not cut off, it will continue to spread and cause major havoc and even death. So they have to cut it off. So gangrene in activity can kill the whole body. See, God's body is not sick, the true body of Christ. So all inactive limbs are not part of God's true church. Profession does not automatically make a, us a limb. It is what, my friend, obedience to the head, allowing the blood of Christ to continually flow through us. Don't you miss that, my friend. Gangrene is caused by, physically, it's caused by a lack of blood supply. But spiritually, it is a lack of blood supply, the blood of Christ flowing through the body. So God does not have gangrene in his church. So his blood, his blood is continually flowing through us and all the true members of God's church. See, the blood of Christ supplies the nutrients and the oxygen to every limb of the body, only if it is attached to the one body. Now, what are the two main pillars in which God's true church, his one body, is built on? Let's go to Psalms 19.7. That is Psalms 19.7. And the Bible says, the law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. So did you catch that, my friend? You find here the two pillars, the law and the testimonies. We'll see it again when we read Psalms 119, 1 through 2. That's Psalms 19, 1 and 2. Blessed are the undefiled in the way who walk in the law of the Lord. Blessed are they that do what, my friend, keep his testimonies and that seek him with the whole heart. You also find this in Deuteronomy 6, 17. And ye shall diligently keep the commandments of the Lord your God and his testimonies, his statutes which he hath commanded thee. The law of God is also known as his commandments. The true church of Jesus is built on the two main pillars, 
law and the, you got it, my friend, testimonies. So in the last days, why is Satan so wroth with those who remain connected to the vine, the one true church of God? Let's go ahead and turn to Revelation 12, 17. Revelation 12, 17, and it says, The dragon was wroth with the woman, that's God's church, and he went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which does what, my friend? Keep the commandments of God and have the testimonies of Jesus Christ. Again, these are the two main pillars of God's church. See, the commandments of God is the Ten Commandments of God and it reveals sin. Oh, I'm getting ahead of myself. But let's go ahead and continue. Remnant. Remnant means remaining ones. So those in God's last day church are known as remnant because they are remaining ones to the one body. They remain in the one body because they continue to keep all the commandments of God and the, there you go, testimonies. So in summary, the law reveals sin. The testimonies, don't miss it, my friend, have a cure for sin. Did you get it or did you miss it? I'll say it again. The law of God, it reveals sin. The testimonies of God have a cure for sin. The law of God is the mirror that reveals sin. The testimonies are the work of Jesus that cleanses us from sin. 1 John 3, 4 says, Whosoever committeth sin transgresseth also the law. For what, my friend? Sin is a transgression of the law. There it is, my friend. The law reveals sin. But let's continue. James 1, 23 through 25 reveals this. If any be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man beholding his natural face into a glass. For he beholding himself goeth his way and straightway forgetteth the matter of man he was. But whosoever looketh into the perfect law of liberty and continue therein, he not being a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. Amen. So the law of God is like a mirror. And those who look into the law of God see their condition. But there are those who look into the law of God, see their condition. But just like this person here, he went away from the law and he forgot the matter of man that he was, meaning he was a sinful person. And the law revealed that. So the law reveals to us, if we look into the perfect law of liberty, we will see that we are sinners and that we need a savior. Amen. So Jesus gives us a power to be a doer of God's holy law if we repent and are converted. Turn from sin. Repent means to turn from sin and to be converted is to turn and to hold on and clean on to Jesus Christ. The commandments of God reflect the character of God. The law of God points us to the testimony, Jesus Christ, to cleanse us from sin. And that's the reason why the law and the testimonies go hand in hand. Now, how do you remain connected to the one body, church of Christ, and become a true disciple of Christ? Well, this is what the Bible says. Let's go to John 15, 7 through 11. That's John 15, 7 through 11. And Jesus says, if ye abide in me and my words abide in you, ye shall ask what ye will, and it shall be done unto you. Herein is my Father glorified, that ye bear much fruit, so shall ye be my disciples. As a Father have loved me, so have I loved you. Continue in my love. If you keep my commandments, ye shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my father's commandments and abide in his love. These things have I spoken unto you, that your joy might remain. Don't don't miss it, my friend. That your joy might remain in you and that your joy might be full. So notice, if we look at the Greek word for abide, it means remain. See, abide has the same meaning as remnant. So the remnant people of God are remaining in Christ, regardless what the world does. And in remaining in Christ, they do what? They keep the commandments of God. 
and the testimonies of Jesus Christ. So we only reflect the glory of God, his character, by living in Christ, dwelling in the true body of Christ through the word of God. If we are not abiding in Christ, we are detached from the true vine, the body of Christ, his true church. We only stay connected to the one true church of Christ by the word of God. By this, we will bear the fruit of God. We will abide in the love of Christ and his love flows through us if we keep his commandments. That's what the Bible says, my friend. It is pretty clear. Let's go to John 14, 15, and then look at verse 21. John 14, 15, and then we'll look at verse 21. Jesus says, if ye love me, what's he say? Keep my commandments. There are a lot of people say, well, I love Jesus. I love God. I love, I, I love to go to church, but they don't keep the commandments of God. They reject the commandments of God. And even particularly, many reject the seven-day Sabbath. It's very clear. So many people look at this text and say, well, well, you don't have to keep the commandments. But God said, if you love me, keep my commandments. In verse 21, he that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me, and he that loveth me shall be loved of my Father, and I will love him and will manifest myself to him. That's pretty clear. Now, how do we love others, and what is the love of God? Let's go to 1 John 5, 2 and 3. That's 1 John 5, 2 and 3. I hope you're following along, my friend. 1 John 5, 2 and 3. But this we know that we love the children of God. When we love God and do what, my friend? Keep his commandments. So we see this over and over and over again throughout the entire Bible. For this is the love of God that we keep his commandments, that his commandments are not grievous. So Satan is out there telling people, oh, you don't have to keep the commandments. They're grievous. They're a burden, et cetera, et cetera. But the Bible says it's not grievous. So who are you going to believe? The Bible or are you going to believe man or Satan himself. Now, truly keeping the seventh-day Sabbath holy confirms that you truly believe and love God. Let's go to Exodus 31. Then we'll look at verses 13, 16, and 17. Pretty clear. Speak thou also unto the children of Israel, saying, Verily my Sabbath ye shall keep, for it is a what, my friend? A sign between me and you throughout your generations that ye may know that I am the Lord that doth sanctify you. Verse 16, wherefore the children of Israel shall keep the Sabbath to observe the Sabbath throughout their generations for a perpetual covenant. It is a sign between me and the children of Israel forever. For in six days, the Lord made heaven and earth. And on the seventh day, what did he do? He rested and was refreshed. Sign in the original Hebrew here means a signal or a flag, beacon, monument, or a evidence or proof. See, God has already proven himself as a sign or proof that we truly believe in him, that we truly love him. We keep God's holy Sabbath day as revealed in God's fourth commandment in Exodus chapter 20, verses 8 through 11 where it reveals, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shall I labor, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. So we know from sunset Friday to sunset Saturday, that is God's seventh day. And that is the Sabbath day, the weekly Sabbath day that God has given to his people as a blessing of rest. Now let's go to Ezekiel 20, verse 12. So in other words, in keeping the seventh day Sabbath is a proof of, or evidence of your love and loyalty to God. Now let's go to Ezekiel 20, verse 12. Ezekiel 20, verse 12. Moreover, also I give them my Sabbaths to be a sign between me and them that they might know that I am the Lord that sanctified them. So keeping the seventh-day Sabbath holy is our weekly signature of our belief and love for God. This is the evidence Remember, the Sabbath is the fourth commandment. Is it possible to be a member of God's one true church by rejecting and violating God's seven-day Sabbath? Absolutely not. No, that's the answer. 
period. Let's go to 1 John 2, 3, and 4. 1 John 2, 3, and 4. Just letting the Bible speak for itself and be very objective of what the word says. 1 John 2, 3, and 4 says, And hereby we do know that we know him if we keep his commandments. And he that saith, I don't I know him and keepeth not his commandments. The Bible says he is a what? A liar. And the truth is not in him. And so that's a lot of people that say they know him, but they don't keep his commandments. And especially the seventh day Sabbath. Now, who does Jesus call those who break just one commandment and teach others to do the same? Let's see what the Bible says. Matthew 5, 19. It's so clear. Whosoever therefore shall break one of the least commandments and teach men so, he shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever shall do and teach them, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Question, do you think those who are not teaching the commandments of God are going to be in heaven? It didn't say they're going to be in heaven. It's going to say they'll be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. Called the least, but not saying they're going to be there because they're breaking the law of God. There'll be nobody in heaven that's breaking the law of God. And if somebody's out there breaking the law of God and then at the same time teaching men so, woe is his soul. Now let's look at the testimony of Jesus. Remember the law of God is 10 commandments reveal sin, but what is the purpose of the testimony of Jesus? Let's go to the word testimony. In the Greek, it means evidence given. In short, the testimony of Jesus is the evidence given of Jesus. The testimony of Jesus reveals the purpose of Jesus to save people from sin. The testimony of Jesus also tells us the ministry and prophecies of Jesus revealed and fulfilled in the word of God. Revelation 19.10 says this, And I fell at his feet. To worship him. And he said unto me, See thou do it not. I am thy fellow servant. So that was speaking of an angel. And of the brethren that have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God, for the testimony of Jesus is the what, my friend? Spirit of prophecy. See, prophecy reveals events before they happen. The Old Testament points to the Messiah, the Messiah's first coming or advent that was fulfilled in the New Testament. The Old Testament reveals the salvation of Messiah to come, the first advent. The New Testament is a fulfillment through Jesus Christ. Jesus promised that he will come again for those abiding in the one church, the one true church of Christ at his second coming. So in summary, the one true church of God keeps both the what, my friend? The law and the testimonies. The law and the testimonies of Jesus cannot be separated. The law and the testimonies of Jesus Christ are the two main pillars of his one true church. From Genesis to now, all those who are in the remnant, the remaining ones, abide in the one true church of Christ. By keeping all the commandments of God, including God's seventh-day Sabbath, and believing the testimonies of Christ which is a spirit of prophecy that reveals the first and the second advent of the coming of Jesus Christ. So my friend, we got to leave it right there. I pray that you learn some things today concerning the two pillars of the law and the testimonies that is part of God's true church. So let us pray. Father, Lord, we thank you for your one true church. And may we abide in you and you abide in us. May we be a part of God's remnant in these last days. And may we keep both the law and the testimonies as revealed in God's word. Help us, Lord, to continue to distinguish the truth from the air by studying the truth on a daily basis. So be with those that's listening today. Be with them and their family in a very special way. Be with them as they go about their various tasks today and keep everyone safe for the glory of God. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Well, my friend, come back tomorrow on the same great and blessed station. May God bless you and Maranatha for Medical Missionary Training, 
go to bcmeonline.org. For the medical missionary training online, go to bcmeonline.org. You learn so much. It is a great blessing. So check it out.